Good evening. I'm Boot Swinnerstein, and on behalf of both WIN, the West Side Interfaith Network, and the League of Women Voters of Seattle King County, welcome to tonight's candidate forum. For the very first time, we're going to be able to elect a representative from District 1, which is West Seattle, including uh, including Del Ridge, Highland Park, where I live, over through South Park. And it's, um, it's pretty easy to see on the map. We go over to the river on the south end of West Seattle and South Park, um, south end of Seattle. Um, we, the, we're going to hear tonight from the candidates for the 1st District. They, these are the official candidates. You may have heard and met, heard some names and met some people earlier in the campaign. But as of the end of last Friday, these are the official candidates and we're very glad <coughs> that you are here. From the candidates who are running for the district offices and the at-large offices, two in each category will, the two top vote getters will advance to the general election. The primary is August 4th, not what is written on your full of errors sheet here. It's, it's the first Tuesday in August. On the back of your sheet, you will see not this one, but on the back of your sheet, you will see listed the candidates for the two at-large positions, city council positions eight and nine. This year, and this year only, you will be voting for three candidates for city council. For time constraints, we did not invite the candidates for the at-large positions tonight, but um, you will be voting for three candidates should you choose in both August and November. The, the at-large candidates are chosen for two-year terms, and then in the next mayoral cycle, they will be elected for four-year terms, and from then on, they'll be on, on staggered terms. So, um, one more just really important thing, a reminder, that all city council offices are nonpartisan. The other important reminder, if you don't know, is that the restrooms are right over here. <laughs> and now I would like to introduce our moderator for this evening, Lucy Gaskell Gaddis, a member of the League of Women Voters. Thank you. I'm also a member of our church, so I will welcome you to our church. This is called Fellowship Hall. Um, so I'm going to sort of explain how we're going to work this. And like many forums, when you have a lot of people, there's some time constraints. So I'm going to ask three questions. And for each question, the first question, I'm going to start the first table, the second, and the third. So we get, they, it's not always going to start with Carl. Um, and I think I'm just going to have to, if you don't mind, just mention you by your first names. Um, and so after that will take about 60 minutes. And then, um, and you could be doing this anytime. Uh, if you want to ask a question, we'll have about a half an hour, and you can ask questions um, on the cards that you've been given, index cards. And there will be there will be several people collecting them. Uh, let's see, Marianne, who is going to be collecting them? Okay, those two those two people will be collecting them periodically. And I will try to remind you to do that. You might obviously want to wait until you hear from some of them to decide what questions you want. So about um, so that will be an hour and a half, and that's kind of the official end of the uh, the end of the official forum. But then uh, we have the room until 8:30, and the candidates are welcome to get up and meet with you individually. So there's an opportunity for you to meet individually with uh, candidates you want to learn more about or ask a question that you didn't get asked during the uh, half an hour of audience questions. Now, an important person for the candidates is our timer. You want to stand up, Terry? <laughs> Terry is Terry Gaddis, um, who happens to be my husband, uh, is going to be the timer. Because the, the questions that I will ask will be uh, two minutes. And so he will tell you 
when you have 30 seconds left, 10 seconds left, and then it says stop now. So, um, all right, so the, the first question, and I'm going to start with Carl. Um, the first question is, why do you want to run for District 1 for the City Council, and what qualifications do you think you have for the job? In two minutes. First of all, thank you all for coming. Um, well, hello, my name is Carl Worsing. My wife, Danielle, and I live over in Delvers on 21st Avenue. Uh, this is my first major campaign. And so the question is, you know, why now? Why this race? I followed politics really closely for a lot of years, always from the outside. And you know, wherever you live, you start seeing certain patterns. You see a lot of great people get into races. They come with big ideas, big promises, a lot of energy. And it doesn't take long before a lot of that passion fizzles. And what you're left with is people who really are more interested in protecting and consolidating their power than really exercising it to help as many people as they can. And there's a really fine line between being experienced and being entrenched. And I'm ruining my name tag, but... <laughs> and you don't ever want to... I don't ever want to lose that fire at the start. I'd rather throw myself into these four years, really give everything I have to flame out. It's been four years treading water and just hoping to move on to the next step. Um, so, yeah. Okay, the next candidate is Brianna Thomas. Do you want to, would it be helpful if they stood up? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, so why, when are you speaking, why don't you stand up? Good evening. Can you hear me just fine? Sure. Yeah. Great. My name is Brianna Thomas, and I am one of your nine candidates for Seattle City Council District 1. Um, I'm running because my time in politics with the different campaigns I've worked on have led me to get a little impatient. Instead of piecemeal wins and individual victories, I think we can work a lot more comprehensively to build the city that we want to see. I have lived all over District 1. I lived in South Park, the Morgan Junction. I currently live in the Alaska Junction. And I also lived in the Admiral District for quite some time. So I know all of the neighborhoods as well as one can on the bus and on foot. Um, in terms of qualifications, I started out my political career in the State Senate and survived that. And then went on to work on campaigns in Snohomish County against Tim Island on 1185, where I spent a lot of time with the League of Women Voters, actually. We're working against that guy. Um, and then I went on to work on the Yes for CTAC campaign down in TTAC in 2013, where we passed the nation's highest minimum wage, I'm sure, with the help of a few people in this room. I'm running right now because I have tried multiple times to convince young women to be the voice that we need in government. And when this seat became open, I felt it'd be a little bit hypocritical not mm -hmm. to stand up and rise to that challenge myself. So here I am. I figured someone's got to go first. And well, I guess there's quite a few of us that felt comfortable <laughs> doing that. Um, and so I'll keep it short. I'm also the 2014 Democratic Activist of the Year. I currently work as a housing and homelessness advocate statewide. And I will say one of the best things about this campaign experience so far has been the civility among the candidates. We really are a nerdy, nice bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is, is Philip Pavel. Thank you. Hi, my name is Philip Tavel. <clears throat> and obviously, like with everybody else, running for uh, your position here in District 1 for Seattle City Council. And the fact is, it's easy why I'm running, is that I have seen so much potential in this town that over the years has gone unrealized. And of late, over the last three or four years, I see more and more a city council that lacks leadership, that lacks the ability to really go out and head of things in a proactive manner. They're constantly reactive, and they're not managing, and they're not following through on their promises and the things that they do. They take the opportunity when a crisis comes up to jump on an issue, they make their political hay, and they move on. And the fact is, we need people who are going to do more than that. It's time to get ahead of these issues. And the truth is, if you're happy with where homelessness is and where the police are and the tunnel and traffic and parking, then it, you stick with what you have. But we have an opportunity now to change that. It's the first time in 100 years that we've gone back to districts. So now we have a chance for a voice from West Seattle to represent West Seattle. 
The fact is, I have spent the last 22 years not as a political insider, but doing a lot of different things. I was a physics teacher for years. I started a video game company that employed 30 people in Pioneer Square. That took me actually to Australia, where I opened a store down there. I came back here, and I became a public defender. I had gone to law school, but I hadn't really used that. For the last 10 years, I've been a public defender here in Seattle, representing people of low income, doing a lot of pro bono work. I do work in family law and intellectual property law as well. And I volunteer in my community. I've done a lot of work with Rotary, with the YMCA. I'm a court-appointed special advocate for children. And all it adds up to the fact is I've been involved in my community, and I really want to serve you now. Thank you. The next candidate is Jody Rushmer. <coughs> I'll see if I get this feedback thing on it. Excuse me. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, League of Women Voters of King County. Thank you so much for the invite. Same for the West Side Interface Network. Jody, you got to get closer. You closer gotta... to the microphone. Yeah. 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 Okay. Hopefully you won't count that against me, Mr. Timekeeper. Uh, okay, so uh, again, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters of King County. Thank you so much for the invite. Same for the West Side Interfaith Network. And thank you all for coming out to see us today. It means a lot to me personally. Uh, why I'm running? Uh, a couple simple reasons. Uh, our district has been underrepresented in city government for decades now. Um, whether it be uh, the lack of viable public transportation alternatives with the viaduct replacement or the current uh, move levy, which is $1 billion of our tax dollars that they want to spend with virtually no material transit solutions offered for the West Seattle or South Park community. Uh, I feel like our district needs a voice, and I aim to be that voice uh, in making sure that we get our equitable share of those monies and transportation help. Uh, also, I'm running to champion uh, West Seattle and South Park schools. Uh, I want to make sure that lack of funding uh, is never a roadblock for our children's success, and I feel like that's been the case for some time now. Uh, raise the mic. Raise the mic? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I get going. Uh, <laughs> So again, champion our schools. I want to make sure that uh, our children have the resources that they need to be successful, and I feel like right now that's not the case. Um, lastly, I feel like that the quality of life uh, that we've all come to enjoy in our district uh, is being challenged. Uh, I feel like right now uh, what we need more than ever is uh, partnerships between community members, business owners, and development to make sure that we develop the community that we want to live in in the future. I feel like at this point, it's really not an opportunity that the horses left the barn, as it were, in terms of stopping development or limiting folks that are moving into our community. We want to make sure that we can build a coalition, work together to build the West Seattle and the South Park that we want to live in in the future. Thank you. The next candidate. Well, first of all, let me thank you all of you. You are exemplars in terms of, you know, I wish we had more people you interested in the political process and voting, you know, that's unfortunate that sometimes the voting goes such a low rate. Uh, first, a little bit of my qualifications, okay. Um, I, um, I have a mission in public administration and city management. Uh, I did a one-year internship where I rotated to different, different city departments, parks and recreation, finance, water and sewer. And since we were fleshly, we had just graduated, they wanted us to look at different departments, what things would we recommend in order to improve services, uh, make services more efficient and responsive to the people. So I'm hoping that that experience will, will, will be good for you. Uh, why am I running? I think, you know, I've been unemployed, I've been underemployed, I have been in a hospital with no insurance. So I feel that, you know, I have some of the things that maybe your average person has to encounter and, and hopefully we can find some solutions to that. Um, some of the other reasons that I'm running, um, I think it's time that it's been a discussion at the national level about education. I think it's time that Seattle, with all of those technology companies that we have, and we don't have uh, people to fill those positions, I think we should offer free two-year community college in Seattle. It's time. Uh, you know,
know, some school over in Shoreline is trying to do it using the foundation money. And it's time, I think, to have some leadership from the city, put together the state people. I'm sure the U.S. Department of Education has to be involved in some way or another. Put that together. I think we've been talking about pre-K. It's, it's a little bit slow in terms of the implementation. I think we need to speed up that implementation so that someone that doesn't have the means to have their children can, can have it in that pre-K type of care. Thank you. The next candidate is, is Chaz Raymond. Thank you. Um, so actually why I'm running and what I've been doing that qualifies me are sort of the same thing. For the last almost 12 years I've been uh, in everybody's face here in West Seattle. I've helped to track trails, publish maps for Feet First, I've been involved in Camp Long, we have a new, now more efficient lodge, we have a challenge course. I've been involved in the sustainable world, helping create sustainable West Seattle. I was one of the people that spent a year doing due diligence on the school library, which now has almost 2,000 members. The city transportation system, I've been on the bike board, I'm sorry, the bike uh, master plan, the transit master plan, the pedestrian master plan, and the rapid ride C plan. So I have a, a deep, deep, deep understanding of transportation and the lack of it here. I was also involved with uh, my local community, Morgan Community Association. That led me to Southwest District Council, which involves all of uh, basically West Seattle, west of 35th. The Del Ridge Neighborhood District Council works on the other side, and we've done some joint operations together. And then I was chair of the City Neighborhood Council, which is the level legislated by the City Council to work uh, with all of the districts, bringing the citizens into government. And so all of that has given me an insight into what the people of Seattle, not just here in West Seattle and South Park, but throughout the city, what they want, what they need, what they think hasn't been happening. Planning has gotten out of hand. The Department of Planning doesn't listen to people. Uh, we know that. Uh, we know that they try to, uh, I've been involved in a hearing examiner issue with Morgan. Uh, so we've had some pushback. My professional experience before moving here to Seattle, I was a 32-year NASA manager for public affairs and then uh, at the end of my career uh, brought the NASA web into the world of interactive data and 508 accessibility. So I had a great deal of experience in the world of accessibility. Universal design is something that we need. So I would take all of that and roll it into my city council position. Everything I've done here in West Seattle, I've done for free. I would be able to do even more if I was here elected. Got a new mic here. All right. I'm Lisa Herbold. The reason I'm running is because I believe that this district deserves a strong, progressive voice to represent its interest on the city council. I believe that I come to this race with a set of skills that make me uniquely qualified to represent the district. You see, I've been working on behalf of Seattle residents and West Seattle residents in City Hall with Councilmember Nick Licata for 17 years. I also have a really strong appreciation for people power, and that's because I got my career started in public service 25 years ago as a community organizer working in low-income neighborhoods. Your job as a community organizer is to get people together and speak to City Hall when your needs are not being met, so I know how to do that. I went on from there to work as a tenant organizer with the Tenants Union. So I've got a healthy appreciation of both the inside and outside um, part of the process. I've lived here in West Seattle for 15 years. I raised my daughter here. She's an adult now. She lives in High Point with her family. I have two grandchildren at Santa Slow Elementary. <clears throat> Some people have asked me whether or not my time at City Hall makes me an insider. Well, if knowing how to get things done makes me an insider, I do know how to get things done. Um, you know. I've made my career and made my reputation on helping people who don't have the year of City Hall. So Seattle is growing at a rapid pace, and I'm running because I want to cultivate jobs that preserve our neighborhoods, qualities, and their diversity. We can do that by working for affordable housing and good working conditions for our workforce. And we can do that if you join me in fighting for policies that make sure that Seattle does not become a place where only the wealthy can live. Thank you. The next one is Pablo Thorne. Okay, 
thank you. Thank you, Little Women Voters, for inviting these uh, people to organize forum. League of Women Voters in Washington much honest than League of Women Vo uh, Voters in Oregon. They intentionally do corruption with uh, media junta. They did not invite any forum of candidate. Okay, my name is Pavel Goberman. I'm originally from former USSR. And thank you all of you for coming to this meeting. Um, I live here in the United States 35 years. 36 years, I ran for office first for constitution, to support constitution in the United States, to put a few federal judges in prison for rape of this constitution. Why? Because I ran now for city council, and next year I'm running for uh, Senator Patty Murray, because she violated the constitution, it should be removed from office as soon as possible. Okay, I do, I work at as I have degree two years technical university five years agricultural university work at as manager successful man, manager have award in one year made my uh, people number one from many uh, years of losses. Okay, I run in for office because uh, I don't say I don't say we need we must or somehow I have experience. I really I solve problem. I have planned to create a few thousand jobs in Seattle. I have planned to improve heavy traffic. I have, uh, I have uh, uh, planned also about housing. Uh, city council corrupted, they corrupted, they sell us this country, they created housing problem intentionally. They, I asked them how much money they got from special interest, from bank, from developers, they did another, but it could be uh, get. And, for example, they give taxpayer your money. Oh, it's all two millions. Yeah. <laughs> Shannon Braddock. Good evening. Uh, thank you all so much for being here, and thank you for organizing this forum. This is indeed the first time all nine of us have been together since the filing day, so it's a pretty great night, I think, for all of us, certainly, and I hope you all get a lot out of this evening. So I have, am running because I believe with effective representation in government's ability to partner with our residents, with our nonprofits, with our businesses to get effective progressive policy done. I, I believe in that. I am a principled progressive policymaker myself. I work with King County Council Member Joe McDermott at the King County Council. I've been his chief of staff for almost five years. Uh, I moved to this community over 16 years ago because it had affordable housing, it had income diversity, it had singles, oh. hello, okay. it had singles, uh, single people, young families, seniors, I just really loved the quality of life here. And the growth that we are facing in this district and in our city are affecting all of those things. They're affecting our affordability, they're affecting our ability to get from one place to another, we've got to address our transit and transportation issues. It's affecting our land use development and we need to find ways to have responsible growth. Um, I, as far as my experience before my time with Joe, which, and also let me point out, at the King County Council, we currently have district representation. Joe represents District 8, which also encompasses all of the District 1 City Council area, so I'm very familiar with the entire region. And we work with nine council members who have very different principles and values and represent very diverse communities. And we know how to pull those people together. Joe's been the budget lead for about three years. I worked with him on those budgets to get unanimous budgets passed with quite a diverse group of both Republicans and Democrats at the table. I have a master's in public administration from the University of Washington. All three of my kids attend Seattle Public Schools, and I'm the, on the board of the West Side Baby, previously was on the board of the West Seattle Food Bank, and have served in my kids' PTA as a legislative and spectrum representative. So very community-rooted and excited for this opportunity. Thank you. Great. Well, now we're going to go to the second question, and we're going to start with Jody. Um, the second question is, the West Side Interfaith Network, or WIND, is very concerned and involved in issues of homelessness. What strategies would you propose for reducing the number of people experiencing homelessness in Seattle? And before you answer, Jody, I just want to remind the audience, if you have some questions, uh, fill out the cards and you raise your hands and the people will come around and pick up your card. Jody. Okay. 
So as far as homelessness goes, uh, the good news is uh, we've got a couple things working for us here. We have the largest United Way, that's the United Way of King County, we have the largest United Way in the United States of America. That's helpful. Uh, in the last several years, King County estimates we've built 6,000 low-income housing units. Again, that's helpful for the homeless population. Um, we also have the Seattle Committee to End Homelessness, who had just completed a 10-year plan to reduce or end homelessness in our area uh, with mixed results, but they've been working hard to make that happen. And also in that same time period, in the last 10 years or so, we've spent about a billion dollars towards reducing or ending homelessness in our city. Uh, so we've got a couple good things going for us. Unfortunately, uh, the homeless number hasn't really budged, and in fact, some statistics show that it's actually ticked up a little bit. If elected to city council, my work would be to work with uh, the Seattle Committee to End Homelessness to build a next 10-year plan and hopefully try to, this time I think part of the problem for the first 10-year plan, they focused on the actual problem as opposed to focused on actual prevention of homelessness moving forward. One of my major initiatives, uh, should I be elected, is going to be uh, to work with our schools to get schools the money uh, through public and private partnerships. At this point, we can't continue to wait for legislation to pay for help in our schools. We need to do something now. If I'm elected, I'm going to work for our schools to get private money into the system to build programs for our kids so that in the future, we don't have to worry about them being homeless. That's what I would do if I was elected to city council to work on the homeless problem. Thank you. Arturo? One of the things that I, that I had written uh, here was, um, I said, I'm ready for the city council because there are too many people in every corner. It seems, uh, as, as in every corner in the city, asking for a dollar at times as persons as senior citizens or youth that need help uh, or people that might be addicted to substances. I think we need to conduct some outreach uh, with this population. I think there's a lot of promise with some of the linkage fee that uh, has been proposed. I think that is something that has worked in other cities. I don't see why it wouldn't work here. Um, I mean, I think you still need to allow for pro private development to, to continue and to go on, and I think there are some claims that maybe that fee would stifle that kind of development, but I, I don't believe it will. So, uh, it is a problem. I think $1,400 is the average rent for a one-bedroom apartment here in West Seattle. You know, for someone that works in a minimum wage type of place, McDonald's, some of those places, we can hardly, we probably had to join all the family in order to be able to pay the rent. So uh, many times I think some of the solutions that we have proposed many times actually perpetrate uh, and ensure that we will always have a, a homeless population. You know, we have a good number of shelters around the city. They pro I'm sure, of course, they are needed. Um, maybe we need to think about converting some of them to permanent housing, uh, get some creative sol solutions going uh, I am committed to that, to any problems. Thank you. Chaz? Thank you. I think we're all very concerned with it, and, and I think the solution is going to be almost a, uh, a handful of different approaches. I'm, I'm a fan of the municipal banking um, initiative that is being looked at right now. I believe that if we have that in place, there are some things that can be done uh, through the city and through the bonding authority that we have. We're almost capped out right now, so we need to be careful about that. I would like to see a conversion of older structures through such things as a municipal bank into public housing. I would like to see the homeless encampments placed in areas that are not industrial wastelands, but closer to residential areas so that the people who do have to spend time in a temporary housing situation are not ostracized and felt like they are outsiders. And I know that there are communities that would welcome uh, homeless encampments, and I believe that the faith community has a real role to play in this. Um, I think that the faith community could also work with the city to acquire properties. I would also like DPD, I would, as if I were elected, I would ask DPD to take a look at our zoning to see what could be done through the private single-family home uh, all of us have property uh, that have single-family homes. Some of that property can be developed. Some of the development can include some low-cost housing. Uh, in fact, the house that I'm living in now has an attached dwelling unit that was incorporated into the main house, but it used to be two families living on one lot. 
we've lost that ability. We could go back to that. It's additional income for the homeowner. It helps defray some things. It provides a lower uh, fee for those that are renting. I would also like to look at uh, co-housing. Uh, in West Seattle, we have successfully uh, undertaken three co-housing projects. That's a way where someone who's living there can actually participate in home ownership. And there are land trusts and home trusts that we can look at. So I think it's a suite of, uh, of solutions, and I would be willing to uh, push forward on the municipal banking because I think the city can do a lot more on its own. Lisa? Well, I think the first thing that we need to do if we're going to address homelessness and affordable housing is accept the fact that this is not purely a supply side problem. We're told over and over and over again that all we need to do is add more supply and affordable housing will just miraculously trickle down to the people who need it most. That's simply not true. Um, for every $100 that a community experiences in, a, in rent increase, there's an increase in 15% of homelessness in that community. So what we need to start with is a strong preservation strategy. We need to be identifying housing that is at risk of large rent increases in speculative redevelopment and identifying ways to preserve the affordability of that housing. We also need better laws for our tenants. We need to protect tenants from arbitrary evictions and we need to help them with better relocation laws when they are displaced. We also need a strategy that uh, re-ups the uh, housing levy in 2016 but also recognizes that we can't rely only on the taxpayer to deal with this problem. We really need to do exactly what it is that we've just recently done with employers in this city. We need to raise the bar for what it means to be a good developer. And that means holding the development community accountable for helping us meet this need, for partnering with us. When developers build apartment buildings or commercial buildings, they create um, the need for housing for the workers in those buildings, often very low income people. So we need to partner with them to address that need. As far as folks who are right now, tonight, surviving on the street, there are 3,772 of them sleeping outside. Our shelters are full. We have been focusing our precious housing dollars on, on permanent housing. That is definitely appropriate, but those people cannot wait until we, we build 3,772 new units. We need more shelter now. Next one is Paul. Uh, okay, or well, this uh, housing uh, problem, it my uh, major agenda when I ran for city. I did some research. A city collected taxpayers' money and gave to private company, for example, Seattle Housing Authority. Uh, last year they gave uh, a few million dollars. How they spent money? It, uh, they pay all own property manager has 186,000 salary. It, it name not profit organization. I spoke before the city council, they ignored my. So I gave proposal, we have to build, people need not luxury, one bedroom or two bedroom apartment. People need shel the shelter overhead. Yeah, I recommend build up smaller, cheaper studio apartment with basement, in basement workplaces where people could work, pay back to society. But they, I spoke before city council ignored it. Also now, you see so many on street, people on street, other businesses, uh, some crime. I, I recommend uh, taxpayers building, uh, union station, Amtrak's building, in other some building use as temporary shelters. It will be for home, homeless in from 10 p.m. till 6 p.m. It will be reduced crime. It will be warm, a warm and secure, safe place with toilet for homeless. But again, uh, ignorance. It. Shortly, I promise concentrate this is solve this problem as soon as all sources must be on spent on uh, reduced homeless. In Seattle must be example for all cities in the United States to solve problems. Thank you. Shannon? So the Committee to End Homelessness uh, describes their goal of homelessness rare, brief, and one time. 
And to do that, we've got to have resources in place for families that are at economic risk. So that includes addressing our housing affordability issues, that includes providing living wages, that includes addressing issues like childcare subsidies for families who don't have the income to both work and stay at home and care for their children. Uh, I also believe we need to address this as the root cause of the problem, so we also need to be addressing our mental health issues and partnering with our communities and our nonprofits that deal with um, individuals facing mental health issues and their families to help them come together and support those that are at risk of homelessness. And addiction treatment is also a big part of our homelessness issues. We've had some success in housing those who are addicted to alcohol or drugs and finding an environment that works for them while still keeping a roof over their heads. I believe that's an important thing for us to do. Providing that stability can take somebody to their next step in their growth and getting out of the issues that they're facing. At the county, I've been very proud of the work we've done with the Youth and Young Adult Homelessness Initiative. And this is an initiative that was led by Councilmember McDermott on the council side, and the executive has strongly supported it, and we have funded it, which helps provide resources for youth shelters for those kids most at risk. It disproportionately affects youth of color and LGBTQ youth, lesbian, uh, gay, bisexual, transgendered youth. And homelessness really affects that population more so than any other youth population. And so we really try to address the issues that bring them to their shelters and uh, cause them to have to go into a place where they're not safe. So providing the services at those shelters, education, outreach, training, I think is another very important thing in a way we can reduce and help to prevent homelessness in the future. I think it's really important when you think about homelessness not to just think about the home itself, because a home is way more than just a roof, and being homeless is way more than just needing a shelter. I agree with what everyone else here is saying um, about the need of thinking of this very holistically. You know, starting with prevention, and Jody was talking about you know, preventing evictions and foreclosures and trying to keep people in their homes first. But once someone becomes homeless, getting out of it, you know, finding an on-ramp back into the community can be just incredibly challenging. And so I've, it's really important to think about all the ways people become homeless. And, Jim was just talking about whether it's, it's mental health, there's economic hardship, you become homeless from uh, the crushing medical debt. And once you become homeless, you lose way more than just your address. You lose your ability, ability to apply for jobs, your place to get prepared, a place to collect mail or have an address or have an email or have a phone number. I've, one of the most exasperating things I think I, I've ever heard people say is, you know, why don't you just get a job? Uh, picture, how hard it is for even young grads today who are living at home, have no rent, have all these resources and advantages, and they, how hard it is for them to get a job. Now imagine if you have none of those resources. Um, so it, it makes me think of a, a great example of a community group that's doing something that I think is outstanding, is Fair Start here in Seattle, which provides uh, training and job placement for in the culinary industry, in addition to actually operating a restaurant in the city so you're giving people an opportunity to learn a skill, giving them a chance to get a job after. And I think that's just a really powerful way. And there are a lot of organizations like that trying to help people get back into the community. Brianna? So every January, we count the number of homeless people on the street and in shelter. And this year, that number went up by 22%. Now, I will allow for the fact that we looked at some places we hadn't looked before. But 22% in a year. Um, and some of those are children. We have 32,000 homeless children, school children, that have housing instability across this state. They're not all right here, but they're all ours. I was at the University of Washington downtown today speaking to a group of international students, and they asked me, why do you have homelessness? This is America. I thought that was the point. And I was like, well, it's a matter of priority. Whether or not it's a priority to actually end homelessness is the challenge that we're facing. Um, the faith community, first of all, in the city of Seattle has been here from the get-go. I used to work at the Church Council of Greater Seattle, and we had not only advocacy programs, but direct service programs. We provided transitional housing to families and to individuals. There was 18 months of wraparound services to make sure that once people stood up, they stayed on their feet. 
Um, so we need to make sure that we're creating programming that is addressing all of the needs of anyone that's experiencing homelessness, primarily the need of dignity. I was at the conference on ending homelessness last week for my organization, and one of the conversations we had was power dynamics and what it means to make sure providers are working with people that are homeless and not talking at people that are homeless and not really getting what they need to be doing with the resources that we do allocate to them. Um, LGBT youth makes up about 40% of our street population and they need specified services. They are already coming from a place of fear and vulnerability and leaving them out on the street isn't you can't just put them in general population. And the last thing I'll say is we need to take a look at where people that are homeless are coming from because they're not all from Seattle. And when we're taking in Richland's homeless, we ought to be able to have some reciprocity with that city. Brianna said one thing that's absolutely true. It's gotta be a priority. The people who are involved in fixing this problem need to make it the first thing because the fact is every day that goes by that we don't have a solution, those 3,700 people are still on the street <clears throat> and there's more. And the fact is there are a couple of things we really could do. Utah has set up a fantastic model where instead of putting people <clears throat> excuse me, into encampments where anybody knows in the Pacific Northwest going from a car to a tent or from the street to a tent is not the best upgrade in the world. But their program in Utah, they found out that if they take a homeless person or a homeless family and put them in an apartment and give them a social worker to help to stay on their feet, it actually ends up costing the city less money in terms of emergency room visits, emergency services to these people, and you give them a sense of pride, a starting place. The other thing we have to do is identify exactly where the homeless are coming from, and two of the biggest things there are fixing mental health services and substance abuse services. And believe me, being a public defender for the last 10 years, we can streamline our municipal court system, and we can find money that we can put back into those services that keeps those people from ending up on the street. Then there's the people who, because of the affordability issue and rents going up at 20, 40, 60, 80 percent in the course of a month, we don't have the infrastructure to provide those people with housing. You have 20,000 plus people looking to these lotteries with the Seattle Housing Authority to find a new place to live, and there's only 2,000 or 2,500 spots. That's too many people. And the truth is we have the resources, we have the willpower, we have the amazing organizations to look at all of the at-risk communities and answer these problems if it's a priority. And if we buckle down and decide that it might not be the sexiest issue in the world, but get them off the street and you'll have another 3,700 people that want to make Seattle better. And we have to fix that now. Thank you all. We're now ready to go on to the third question. Uh, and we're going to start with Lisa. The third question is, and some of you have mentioned this already, which issue or issues would be a priority for you as a city council member? So, I have a deep commitment to advocacy for this community and roots in the community as well. And the, those deep roots and that strong commitment mean taking a stand for equity. Equity means a lot of different things. It can mean addressing income inequality, but it also means addressing access to opportunity. Equity means addressing the infrastructure needs of our community so that the areas that need investment most get it first. Equity means responsive policing that is fair and without racial bias, and when it fails to live up to that promise, the police are held accountable. And finally, equity means that the development community is paying its fair share and being a partner in addressing the needs of our community and maintaining the livability and the values that we cherish so much. The job of the City Council is to make sure that Seattle grows in a way that protects those values. And when those values are threatened, if I'm an elected City Council member, I will make sure that West Seattle's voice is represented, and, and South Park's voice is represented at the table. I'm committed to transparent government and active participation in decision making. These are my most closely held beliefs. And if I'm elected to represent you on the city council, I won't just be a vote among nine. I will lead on these issues, and I will deliver results for West Seattle. Uh -huh. uh, for me, the first priority is create jobs, uh, improve heavy traffic, 
I said a few thousand shops, not where Seattle, in Seattle, maybe more. Um, also, uh, developed fish farm. We have to stop by fish from China and buy old fish. Uh, improve traffic, it fight crimes. It has to be harder punishment for crimes. And no any excuse for mentally ill. Also, people's health. Prohibit use chemical in food. All GMO in product of animal in poultry, poultry uh, uh, feeded by antibiotic must be labeled. And also very important housing. All resources delay on it. Well, some other some infrastructure built road. All resources must do so. Uh, housing problem. It will be reduced crime uh, in safe city in the country. Country big money on housing. Improve education. Uh, English must be official language. In, poly, in school, uh, it's very difficult to teach uh, children if uh, uh, students have no discipline. Uh, and the uh, police must help uh, teachers to have discipline in school. Also, on request of uh, people, request on residential address must be keep confidential. Uh, on public transportation, also have to develop uh, at, um, some uh, transit system. Some people live far away from bus stop. Have to use small uh, mini buses and deliver uh, resident uh, riders from far away from stop to bus stop. It will be also help people improve in more money, uh, uh, less money spent on public housing. Thank you. Shannon. Thank you. If I have the privilege of serving as the District 1 Seattle City Council member, my priorities will include, of course, housing affordability and homelessness prevention. Uh, I, I very much am active and engaged in support for children and families so that they, and we all have an opportunity and access to a good quality of life. This means early education support. I'm excited about the Universal Pre-K Pilot Program. That's something I will be very interested in following and hopefully in uh, spreading uh, to reach a wider population. I'm also very interested in uh, child care resources for families at economic risk, trying to see ways that the city can partner with people to help us improve opportunities there. And then as I'm out doorbelling, of course, in District 1, much like throughout the city of Seattle, people are very concerned about transit and transportation. So that will obviously be something that I would be very focused on as your city council member, trying to be sure that we are improving our transit connections and our uh, opportunities to get folks into a pub our public transit system. I would support our Sound, Sound Transit 3 light rail line coming into West Seattle and Ballard. I would work hard with the state to try to get that done. And I would also want to address, of course, the other thing we hear a lot of at the doors is about uh, responsible growth and making sure that we're finding ways. I do, I want to look at when I get to the city, if I'm there, trying to find ways to get the Department of Planning and Development, the Department of Neighborhoods, and the Office of Economic Development to work less in silos and more cooperatively with each other as we're moving forward. Because I think they all have things to offer. As we're moving to districts, we're gonna have a better sense of what different urban villages and different areas of our city are interested in as they're moving forward. And all of these folks that are working hard in these departments to try to do good things for our city, if we can get them to collaborate a little bit more, silo a little bit less, I think we can find some great success as we're facing this massive growth in our city. You know, it could be hard to know where to start, but that's it though, you do need to start. Um, I would say I have several key priorities that I would love to push, and one of them is very near and dear to me as uh, really focusing on smart growth and uh, public transit. I work for the University of Washington, and so I am one of the unfortunate uh, carpoolers and drive commuters. So I have a pretty first-hand view of uh, what's happening on our roads, just how much they more they can handle and it's not a linear equation. People think, oh, a few extra cars added here, it's gonna slow us down a little more. We're at a breaking point where a few extra cars or a single small accident brings the whole city to its knees. Uh, you might remember the salmon truck accident. Uh, I was picking up a friend on Stewart, and I spent 45 minutes going one block. Uh, it's, it was horrifying, but we did get him and had a nice night. So, but I think it's, public transit is more than just you know, allowing people to 
you know, get across the city. You're talking about mobility. University of Washington is one of the largest employers in the state and has all kinds of job opportunities from the top to the bottom. And how hard it is to get from West Seattle to Washington, the main campus, whether you're on bus, it'll take you an hour and a half. Uh, on bike, it'll take you about that long on about a dozen different roads and trails. So this is about mobility, connectivity, and really just spreading opportunity to everybody across the district. Uh, other big priorities for me are aggressively preserving green space, parks, and undeveloped land, and sort of ensuring Seattle's uh, place as a, a global environmental leader. I'm also uh, really interested in revitalizing neighborhoods with uh, small business development and ensuring that we maintain a diverse, affordable community here. We are always going to be wiser, smarter, and just better people when we have people, neighbors around us of all income levels, all ideas, all backgrounds, and we're all working together. Brianna? Well, we're all going to have to tackle the bridge, because the bridge keeps tapping us. So there's that, transportation and infrastructure. One of the things I'm most passionate about really is gender pay equity and income equity in general throughout the city. When we passed the $15 minimum wage here in Seattle, we, we really changed the conversation about the distribution of wealth. And for me, the fact that we don't have more accountability, that the women who hold positions in our city get paid the same as men who hold the same positions in our city bothers me. But it doesn't end at the city. We can change the culture of how we do business here in this city just like we created a new minimum wage for. We can create a new paradigm about gender pay equity in the private sector. I particularly get a little bit nervous about this because though Amazon and some of the more technology-driven organizations that are coming to the city and being economic drivers are a great boon for us and create positions, these positions are not equal. Um, we fought really hard for reproductive freedom and control of our bodies. I'd like control of my pocketbook as well. Um, another thing I think that we could do to protect workers are things like predictive scheduling. Right now, part-time workers are treated like second-class citizens. They don't have a guaranteed number of hours per month. They're treated poorly because they can't make their bills meet. And we talk about them like, well, you know, these, these minimum wage jobs are supposed to be starter jobs. They're for teenagers. The average person with a minimum wage job is 36 years old. You know, this is, this, is not, this is not their fault. This is where we've come and how far we've gotten. Another thing I'd like to do is create trust with the police. Quite frankly, I don't trust them right now, but I don't think they trust me either, so I guess it's fair. I'd like to get them out of their cars. I'd like them to be responding to stolen packages on an Admiral the same way that they respond to stolen packages in the Morgan Junction and stolen packages in South Park. Right now, there's not equity in the way policing is happening. And I'd like to get the police out of their cars and meeting the neighbors. And let's start building some trust. Philip? Thank you. By a show of hands, who in here thinks Seattle right now is perfect? <laughs> All right. By a show of hands, who in here is totally happy with the way West Seattle is changing? That's where I would start, both of those places. The fact is, we have a chance for new blood on the city council, someone that has not been part of the infrastructure, that has not been part of getting us to the place where no one's raising their hand that they're totally happy, and no one's raising their hand that they like the way West Seattle is changing. We need to address these issues. We've got a lot of development that ha that's happening that we don't like. And it's not that development's bad and change is bad and growth is bad, but when it feels like we haven't had a voice in how it happens, and it feels like a little bit of being shoved down our throats, it doesn't feel good. When it's done without enough parking, when it's done without consideration for traffic, when it's done without consideration for changing the face of the neighborhood that some of us have lived in for a very long time, it's not good, and that has to change. And on top of that, <clears throat> we need to work and look at changing tr the transportation issues in this town. Once again, Bertha and the tunnel is not going forward, and who knows what's going to happen. We're already three years behind in replacing a viaduct that they say was going to be unsafe. However, even if we had the tunnel, we lose a downtown exit here in West Seattle, so what do we do? We've got a 12 to 18 year plan to get mass transit here with light rail, that's too slow. That's got to be faster. We've got to fix the buses in this town because it's not just about going from here to downtown. It's about being able to get across the whole city, to go to the U District, to go to Ballard, to go to Kent, to go to somewhere other than one spot where if you miss your connection, you have to Uber to your job. Those things need to be fixed. And we have a chance to fix them all 
and pay attention. This is your opportunity as a neighborhood to say, let's put someone in office who has new ideas that wants to fix the problems we have. Jody? So this one's pretty easy for me. Um, I want to focus on West Seattle issues first. We could talk about what the city needs. We could talk about how to help the city. The fact of the matter remains, West Seattle and South Park haven't had a voice in local government, as I said before, for decades. We need to work on West Seattle issues first. If we talk about transit, if we talk about public transportation, we need to find a way to get us off of this island as efficiently as possible. No one's talking about that. No one's spending money to do that outside of folks in West Seattle. If elected, I would be the one to give voice to this community to say, hey, it's time that we start spending some of these transportation dollars in our community. In the last three weeks, I've seen multiple Seattle Department of Transportation presentations where the only thing that they've talked about doing to our community is removing parking, removing a lane on 35th Avenue, making lanes skinnier, and while I understand the goals behind those, I don't understand how reducing capacity helps us get where we need to go in West Seattle. When I was at a presentation earlier last week about the move levy, Here's a billion dollars. They're going to charge each of us $275 a year on property tax so that they can spend a billion dollars in other parts of the city. <laughs> when I asked the Seattle Department of Transportation representative about that, for lack of a better phrase, his term was, well, West Seattle's going to have to wait its turn. Pardon me? <laughs> now, I've lived in West Seattle since the 70s, and the last major transit improvement that I recall is them building the West Seattle Bridge. Well, that's great, but what else? What are we going to do with 35th Avenue? How can we increase capacity so that we can get buses and cars off of this burg? It's a great place to live, but if we don't address transit now, we're going to be in trouble in 10 years. I was here 10 years ago. I've seen the decline in being able to get off of this island, and I don't want it to be another 10 years of the same thing. The other thing that I can speak to that's a little bit different than uh, the other folks up here today is we need to get some money in our public schools right now. We're talking about raising minimum wages. That's outstanding. I don't want our kids, I don't want our grandkids, I don't want our nephews and nieces to have to worry about getting a minimum wage job. I want good jobs, educated jobs, careers for our kids, and I'm going to work to make that happen. Thank you. Arturo? Okay, well, again, thank you for hosting us. Um, I've been reading a book lately that is called Age of Inequality. The guy that wrote it is, his name is Joseph Stiglitz. We live in a different country, really, than we did many, some years ago. Uh, I think it's wonderful, this issues of transportation, homelessness, low wages. It's going on throughout the whole country. I'm glad to, to, to see that Seattle has so much more progressive type of attitude uh, on some of those issues. We have a Congress that is not moving. We have a Congress that is not doing anything about transportation uh, nationwide. Um, so this is why my priorities would be education. You know, getting more people educated with the technical skills that they need to have to get a job, that will get them better wages, okay? This is why we need to go into pre-K to make sure that those, all of those kids have access to, to uh, are ready for a school when they get to the school and, and they will determine a lot of, of their future and they will be a lot successful. Um, I work in a mental health uh, facility that also works with uh, substance use disorders. I like to ask to, to have more emphasis on that and have more funding for, for that. Uh, they will get rid of a lot of our issues that we have. Transportation is an issue because the whole country is, is Transportation is an issue in the entire country, it's not just here. Infrastructure is, is just rotting. I was in Chicago this weekend, and this is why I couldn't be someplace else, and it's crumbling. And what are we doing about it? At least here, we are doing something about it, and, and I promise you that we will do that, and we'll make transportation a priority, wages, education, uh, taking care of homelessness. Uh, that's just a symptom of something. Thank you. Chaz? Well, I think we're all in concurrence that the three top issues and, and the ones that I have selected for a long time are transportation, equity, and accountability. And transportation is real simple. Uh, it's not just getting in and out of West Seattle. In the last six years, uh, how much time have we all lost on one trip? 30 minutes? 40 minutes? How many hundreds of millions of dollars of your life 
has been taken away with absolutely no mitigation. And it's not just getting into and out of West Seattle, it's getting around West Seattle. SDOT has been told time and time and time again that the intersection at Fauntleroy and Morgan the intersection of Fauntleroy and Morgan is a failed intersection, and yet they will not even consider reconstructing it. That's recalcitrance that just cannot stand. So transportation, yes, I will, I will dive in. I have deep knowledge in that area, and I've been pushing back on SDOT for years. Equity, we have drainage issues here in West Seattle and South Park that have not been fixed for 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, the back alley of the junction, for heaven's sakes, every winter becomes a lake. How can the city ignore that? This is a growing urban village. So the equity has to do with the redistribution of city resources where it's appropriately needed. Uh, it's great that we have 40,000 Amazon jobs downtown. That's great. So now we can focus on other areas. South Park, West Seattle need to focus. And accountability, yes. We need to be able to go to City Hall and examine the budget and look at things that are happening. We have no view into all of the funds that SDOT uses. We have no view into the funds that SPD uses. We just have no idea beyond the general purpose outline. So there's a lot of information which is kept from us, which I would dive into. Uh, the issue of accountability. Years ago, the city council was told that there would be issues with Bertha. Everybody ignored them. Um, why? Uh, you know, I would not be that person. I would actually dive in and figure out what could go wrong and have a mitigation plan if it did go wrong. Well, thank you all. I did a great job. We are uh, on time. Uh, one thing I would like to remind everyone is several people have mentioned schools. We do, in fact, have a school board race in this district. I think it's District 8. I've forgotten. Yeah. But there are six. six. Thank you. Um, so there are four people who are running for the school district. So that's another race that you should pay attention to. So we're now um, going to go into the time where we have uh, some questions from the audience. I'm trying to choose things that we haven't talked about too much. And you will all have one minute to answer these questions so we can get as many as we can in here in the next half hour or so. So one of the big issues you're going to face as a district council member is faced with questions that maybe don't favor West Seattle, but are good for the city as a whole. And how will you decide how to focus on that kind of issue? And this one, let's see, we're, I think we're starting with Carl again. One minute. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I would say in general that, with the exception of some of these transportation issues, what is good for the city is good for all of us. And uh, Brianna has talked about um, really focusing on uh, you know, pay equity. We've talked about affordable housing. These are across the scale, every neighborhood. So these affect, those are easy to support because supporting them across the city supports them here at home. But because we have a voice, because we have access, it's important to be not strident, but to be very assertive, to make sure people know that this community is engaged. We have extremely important priorities to be addressing right now and we need someone who's not just going to stand in the back, you know, pipe up here and there with a few nice opinions. Someone who really is going to stand up and represent us very strongly. Thank you. This is a great question we've gotten a couple of times. Um, I think that what we do is what we're doing here right now and what we've done this whole campaign. We take a look at what we understand to be best for the city as a whole. We focus on as much of West Seattle as we can highlight. And then we stand up here and let all of you talk at us for two minutes at a time and listen to what you have to say about the decision-making process. I've said all along that Seattleites and West Seattleites in particular are not at all shy about voicing their dissatisfaction and their elected officials at the ballot. So what you'll get to do is judge whoever one of us wins this for four years. You'll watch us make decisions and hopefully you'll take them as a collective and not just pin us with one that you disagree with, but you'll give us a chance to respond on why it is we decided what we decided and how we can work closer to what it is that you want. West Seattleites are not shy in the least about voicing their opinions. So I'm sure if there's a vote that's coming up that pits the district against the city, you'll give us a lot of headway on that. Okay, Philip. Uh, the fact is, you're electing a voice for West Seattle to stand with eight other council members for West Seattle first. 
If there's an issue that comes up that's great for the rest of the city but bad for West Seattle, fine. It's an eight to one vote and it passes. But the fact is you want someone who is not going to back down, who is going to be a loud, intelligent voice, and who's going to make sure that everything possible that needs to be said about why this isn't good for West Seattle and South Park and every other neighborhood here is told. For the last 10 years, I've been a public defender, and I frequently am the voice for someone that nobody else wants to speak for. I love this because this is an opportunity to speak for the 80,000 people that live in my favorite part of the world. And what I will tell you is this, if I'm in that council room with eight other people, our needs will be listened to. Jody? I think that one of the big problems that we're dealing with today is divisiveness in politics. It really makes me feel a little sad, actually, and not in a naive way that for whatever reason, it doesn't seem like we can agree on anything. You have teachers that are mad at the school district, and the parents are mad at the teachers, and it, it seems like everyone's upset with each other. You have a citizenship that's upset with the police, and the police are upset with leadership, and the leadership is upset with the feds. And, it goes on and on. If I'm elected as city council, I think one of the first things that I want to do is try to build coalitions between these groups. I think that more working together is likely what we need in this community. Uh, representing West Seattle First will always be part of my platform, but again, building coalitions and relationships between affected parties, groups, and administrations will be a primary part of uh, what I do as your city council. Arturo? I think when you get to those areas, it's always the, the issue of being what they call parochial, you know, where we only concentrate. Seattle is our city, and obviously there are some issues in West Seattle that we have to deal and address, but the issue of homelessness, you have to look at the entire city in order to be able to address that issue, uh, you know, fully. Uh, the issue of transportation, of course, we have to look at our own needs of transportation here. The bridge is definitely one of them. Uh, that we need to look at and have an alternative to that. But I think we need to look at alternative to the whole city as well. So education, I think, is a great equalizer. Uh, and, and I would stick for that for the entire city and obviously for our district as well. I think we get uh, South Seattle Community College in our area so that we could count on that. Thank you. Chaz? Thank you. Well, I do have a practice uh, series of years working for the Southwest District Council was representing a portion of West Seattle on the City Neighborhood Council and then chairing the City Neighborhood Council. I could listen to all 13 districts and now those 13 districts are against our new City Council District system. So, yes, uh, what I've learned over the last dozen years is that there are many areas of the city that share exactly the same issues that we have. There are the areas in the north that have drainage problems that have transportation issues. There are safety issues in the south end of town just as there are in the far north end of town. The, the real issue is trying to distribute some of the assets. So one of the things that I would seek would be getting more jobs in West Seattle, which helps solve a couple of problems at the same time. Transportation issues, you can walk to work, you increase the local pay, and you actually help things out. And early childhood learning and summer and after school jobs, that's very important. We need to employ our youth, and the city can find programs to do that, working across the community centers, the library, uh, parks and rec. Hey, Lisa? So I only started thinking about running for city council after districts passed. I think it's a great system for finding out what the voters want. We're all out there door knocking, talking to people, finding out what they care about. It's also a great system to hold your elected officials accountable. And I really count on you to hold me accountable should I be elected to represent you. I'm a passionate believer in participatory decision making. I will consult with you before decisions are made. And um, I will count on you to let me know when your needs aren't being met. I think really uh, I, I believe in squeaky wheel governance. It really makes a difference. And I also believe that when you have seven city council members that are all working to make their district the best it can be, you will have a, a healthy city. I do also agree that many of the issues that we face in, in District 1 are also faced in other districts, and we can collectively deal with those problems together. Again, I don't say... We need, we, we must somehow 
I have a concrete plan to solve many problems. One of them, um, my priority is create job, uh, reduce heavy traffic, fight crime, solve housing shortage, uh, help homeless, save uh, city, country, <coughs> country, big money, about people's health, I say it, about pro prohibit to use chemical and food. Improve education. It's a shame. Very low uh, graduation from high school. Who will defend this country? Invite from China and India. Um, reduce sales and property taxes. The Seattle Senior Center must be open for four hours on Saturday and Sunday. It's a second home for many senior citizens. They could go there and spend time. And, and more, more important, prevent nuclear war. This administration creates a very bad, bad problem. Thank you. Shannon? Thank you. Um, effective leadership requires the ability to prioritize and to collaborate on behalf of the district, on behalf of the city, and on behalf of our region. And that means building working relationships. In my role at the King County Council, that's what I spend a great deal of time doing, building relationships with other staff, relationships with electeds, uh, relationships with stakeholders that are involved in the decision making as we're moving forward. And as a city council member, that's exactly what I would plan to do. I would plan to understand the priorities of the other members on the city council and understand how we can help each other to reach our priorities on behalf of our districts and ways to collaborate and move forward. And then obviously, when needed, to push back when I say, no, you, your priority has an unintended consequence on my district. And I will fight for that. I'll be an effective leader. I know how to collaborate. I know how to bring people together. And I understand the natural tension that comes as you're dealing with all of these issues. So I look forward to the opportunity. Thank you. The next question involves a big issue in West Seattle, and that is density and incredible development of apartments. So the question is, you know, do you think there's a limit? What would you do to deal with the um, rising density in this city, this in West Seattle, which is known as an urban village. So this question, we're going to start with uh, Jody. You know, I think this concept of urban, excuse me, I think this concept of urban villages is an interesting one. I was doing some research, listening to Seattle Department of Transportation talk again, and spending too much time doing that later, pardon me. Uh, but they told us in the mid-90s, Let's create these urban villages. We're going to concentrate where people live, and then the quote that I heard was, we're going to throw infrastructure at these urban villages. So you concentrate the density of these people, and what we'll do is we'll build transit solutions, extra roads. We'll make it easy for you to get in and out of there. We'll make it easy for you to walk around in the community, et cetera. What I found is, again, back to the West Seattle Bridge analogy that I used a moment ago, it's just not the case. We built a lovely urban village in the West Seattle Junction, but they haven't given us any additional infrastructure. And so... In that regard, I think me as your city council person, I would really spend a lot of time working to get those resources to our community. Same thing in South Park. Uh, they closed it one day. All of a sudden, the First Avenue South Bridge was just closed. That shocked me. I was like, I've never heard of a major bridge for a community just closing out of the blue. I want to fight to make sure things like that don't happen in our community. Thank you. Arturo? Well, when I see a lot of those huge apartment buildings being built, you know, right around here, I'm wondering, you know, that is, what are we doing in terms of the transportation? How are we going to get these people in and out again, right? So I think there has to be a limit. Uh, you know, we need to work with the planning department and see what are some of the issues that we are looking at. Uh, every little piece of land that it is that opens up, that is a house that's sold up the street from where I live, that house has a backyard, so I know somebody bought it so they can build one you know, apartment building here and another one behind the house. So there needs to be a limit, I think, uh, to that, especially if you want to preserve the, the, the character of this community. So we need to work with the planning department and put in some of those limits um, in building the infrastructure that will support some of the people that are already living here. Thanks. Chaz? So the urban village strategy was shown to be effective in areas where the city put money, and the Alaska Junction was one of those areas, Columbia City was one of those areas, Rainier Beach was not one of those areas. 
So we know that when the city invests money in urban villages, it works. What they haven't done with West Seattle is that they had banked on the monorail being in place, and then they dropped the ball for the next seven years after we voted it down. So what I would do is I would request DPD put a halt on development until the transportation needs needs actually caught up. There's no reason that we should suffer under these kinds of conditions. And it's not just the transportation. It's the streets that are taken out of service for construction. How many of you have been in, in the junction when you had to cross and cross back? If you go downtown, it's the same thing. So we have not managed our construction to the advantage of anybody but the developers, and I did change that seriously. I would also request that, uh, were it possible, that the Department of Planning uh, and Development take a look at what it would take to completely redo the entire zoning code. Lisa? So, as you can imagine, development is probably the topic that we hear most about uh, when we're out talking to folks. People aren't opposed to density, but they feel that the city has done a really poor job of managing it. Um, it's true that there was a promise made that in accepting density and accepting the urban growth strategy that there would be concurrence in infrastructure investment. And I think the city has fallen short on that promise. Um, as your council member, should I be elected, I would do several things. Um, I would look at passing developer impact fees that will help fund um, investment in our communities, improve transportation that's associated with growth, as well as open space. I would also support taking a look at how development and density impacts displacement. And finally, I would want to take another look at the parking policies that were passed in 2010 um, that require zero parking in areas that are in urban villages and have um, frequent transit. Uh, I stand for a city must control spending. Uh, now we are concerned about national debt, about 17, maybe 18 trillion dollars, and interest about 2 trillion dollars on interest paid to China and other companies. How many jobs could be created on this trillion, trillion dollars? How many houses could be built up? Therefore, city must be in charge of taxpayers' money. Don't uh, put Wolf in charge of a herd of uh, ships as cities spend money on housing authority. We, in, it, we build more housing, it will be reduced spending on, on the welfare, on, on the homeless. It's all for benefits of people. Have to control spending. Thank you. Shannon? Uh, again, I support the urban village concept and agree that we have been left behind on our infrastructure. Uh, I, I do think it's, I mean, not funny, I guess, but that the monorail was supposed to be a part of our of our comprehensive plan. So we're also looking at our 2035 comprehensive plan, and I would encourage everybody to provide input on that when you can. I would support impact fees from developers at some level to mitigate construction and development. I think that's a really important thing for us to do. I also agree with the review of the parking policies, and I also really appreciate the design review process that uh, is available so that communities can come and provide input as developments are coming into their areas. The reality is the growth is here, and we just need to find smarter, better ways. Again, as I mentioned before, I would like to see our Department of Planning and Development cooperate more with our Department of Neighborhoods, our Office of Economic Development, so that we can try to have a more cohesive strategy moving forward in these pockets of our urban villages throughout the city. Carl? I think with density, I think we all agree that you know adding apartment buildings to your neighborhood can seem like a pretty unpopular compromise from the gigantic pit in your neighborhood to the construction around that seems to last for years. But there are benefits that come from having some people uh, in a more dense area. And there are parts of our district that could really benefit from the business, the retail, the restaurants, and the groceries that can come from having a walkable, slightly more dense neighborhood. If you've driven down Delbridge Avenue recently, it's for a really long, sort of eternal string of townhomes and older homes. And there's almost not a single business district along the entire way. You can get some pho, you can get some pizza, but there's not a grocery store. There is a co-op, which I hope you guys will all support. Um, but that's an opportunity where you could actually use the density would benefit us. It would bring more retail, more sense of community, and all kinds of other benefits to our district. Brianna? 
One of the parts of the conversation around density that is more important to me is not just where we're building and how we're building, because I live next to one of those giant holes. I wake up to the future every morning. Um, but what we're building, I feel like we've been pretty focused on single occupant units, and we're not really building for families in West Seattle. We're trying to find a two-bedroom apartment that's affordable in this town. Um, you know, we've got a lot of new people moving in, and that's great, but at some point they may want to have a roommate, or they may want to start a family, or they may want to move out of the home that they're in and downsize and have a little less um, property to actually manage themselves. These are all options that we as renters and property owners ought to have, and we're not actually building for that future right now. We've got a lot of young single people moving into the city, which I think has pushed some of the apartments and some of the single units, and I get that, but at some point, you know, they might want to have a baby or something. And where are we going to put it? Because you can't have a baby in a house. Let's not. Philip? First thing we really need to do, obviously, is we need to see what's the effect of the density increases we have going on now. We've got thousands of apartments coming in. We've got a couple of giant holes still where there's going to be new buildings. Let's give it a little bit of time. Let's see what happens to the parking. Let's see what happens to the traffic. You know, you heard Chad say it, there was, you know, a failure of management. You heard Lisa say it, there was a failure on the promise. And that's what it's been. There have been failures that have gotten us to this point where we feel unhappy about how our neighborhood's changing. But let's see what happens. I mean, a lot of people in the city would support more development, more of these things happening, because they say that's the way we're going, that people are moving in who don't have cars, who just take mass transit. If that's the case, then we'll see it happen. But if the traffic gets worse and the parking gets worse and we feel worse about it, then we need to look to other places rather than just the Alaska Junction to increase density. We need to look to the rest of the district. But let's find out what happens first, and then let's see if we need more of it. Another hot topic is taxes. We, we've seen lots of ballot issues to raise taxes to do good things. Are we reaching the limit where taxpayers won't support additional taxes? How would you prioritize what goes on the ballot? And this time we're going to start with Lisa. Well, that's a good question. Um, so we do have a very large transportation levy on the ballot uh, coming up this coming November. <coughs> the council is um, taking a look at it right now. Um, I think, I do believe that we need more than uh, $930 million worth of investment in our transportation infrastructure, absolutely. But I believe that the move levy should be packaged differently, much like the bridging the gap levy was packaged, um, when it included not only taxpayer property taxes, but also revenue from employee head tax and commercial parking tax. And when you go out to the taxpayer with a package that isn't completely borne by the taxpayer, your chances of getting it passed are actually greater. And I think that's the message that our population needs to hear if we want them to vote for um, these measures. Paul? Uh, taxpayers pay uh, city council member salary, but city council member <coughs> Members, they abuse their power. They demand from many home owners to maintain a city property close to their home. It's not acceptable. If no, they demand pay a fine. It's not proper way. About uh, taxes, uh, there is no need too much brain to run city or country by increasing taxes. And my statement is, reduce sales taxes, reduce property taxes. You must know where your money is going. Thank you. Shannon? Uh, obviously, our regressive uh, tax system at the state level has put us in this position where municipalities are forced to either create special districts or levies in order to fund all of these things that we deeply care about, things like the children and family ed levy, things like the transportation, the move Seattle levy. Uh, things like a housing levy that will be coming up. So I, wor I certainly worry that our taxpayers will get to the point where they're saying, no, it's too much, which is why we have to demonstrate our accountability to those levies being effective. We have to demonstrate that in the long run it will save you money to invest in our children. We have to demonstrate that, again, that we are building a broad package, that we are looking at all of the other possible revenue resources and be transparent about how we're doing that, that we're not just saying, 
hand us a big bucket of money and we'll figure out how to spend it for you, but that we're showing really good plans, demonstrating how that levy in the long run will serve our citizens and save us, do economic, save us dollars so that we have positive economic futures for our families within our district and our city. Carl? Yeah, taxes are, you know, on the one hand, it, it makes a lot of sense that you would tax through property tax and sale tax the people who are sort of invested here. We have a great stake in our community, so it seems you know, partially logical to expect us to fund a lot of our development. But that's a delicate balance because you can only squeeze you know, your base so long before they will revolt, before even incredibly smart investments. If you add a levy to get light rail here, like in six weeks, you know, after a point, even that will seem too much if you already feel like you're paying a ton of property tax or you know another few cents on your sales tax. How to get around that? That's a that's a tough question. I definitely agree that accountability and really finding out what we're spending on. I know there is waste in there. I know there's a way we can save money. And down the road, if our state can finally agree to some sort of very marginal income tax, I think that would go a long way toward that one. Brianna? I absolutely fear voter fatigue when it comes to levies. I've worked on campaigns for a while, and you can only say yes so many times before you start to feel the burden of it, and you start to see, you get the bill every April. Um, in terms of prioritizing the levies, I think that if we worked harder to get impact fees from the development that it's coming in, then we wouldn't have to put the housing levy at risk. Then we could go ahead and make sure that those school levies keep passed season after season, that our parks stay well maintained. Um, I'm also in support of a head tax for employers in the city because, again, if you're doing business in the city of Seattle, you should be meaningfully reinvesting in the infrastructure that you are benefiting from as you create profit. It's not my job as a city council member to make sure that all businesses um, are treated What's the word? I think right now in a weird way we hold a business up and it's this untouchable thing and we don't want to upset the business climate. I think maybe we should upset them a little bit and, and see what it does to burden, lessen the burden on our taxpayers. I, I see two real problems with the way we do taxes in this town. Number one, like Shannon said, we have the most regressive taxes in the country. What that means is the bottom percentage of the people are paying 16% of what they make to tax and the top percent are paying two. That's the biggest spread in America of any country. Now, the other thing, we seem to be pretty levy happy in this town. Now, for myself, as a renter, it hasn't made that much of an impact, but I know a lot of people who own homes and own businesses, and it seems that every time we need more money, whether it's 270 million for a new emergency service or a little billion dollar thing to fix the transportation issues, let's just raise property taxes because it's just $250 per $400,000 home. That adds up after a while, and what it means is we're not looking at saving money. We're not talking to SDOT about how can you create efficiencies so you don't need a billion, and maybe you need 700 million because you can save money somewhere else, or that there are other things in the city that maybe we're spending too much, and we don't just need to tax to get more. Yeah. Oh, Tony. Great question. I'm glad this one came up. Uh, this is actually another reason why I decided to run. I'm sick of riding home in my car and yelling at the radio every time something new comes up and the answer is, let's raise taxes. You want schools? Great, let's raise taxes. You want fixed roads? Great, let's pass a levy. You want uh, parks? Great, let's pass a levy. Your fire department needs something? Cool, let's raise taxes. We have an awful lot of money out here in this city. I think someone needs to dive into the budget and really find out where they're spending the current money that we have. Can't just be the answer every single time something needs fixed. Let's just charge the voters a couple bucks. They won't mind if the economy's good out here. That's not okay with me. I doubt it's okay with you all. Uh, if elected, I'll be the one diving into that budget. I'll be the one flipping through page by page and finding out where that money is going. And hey, let's do a reallocation of some of those funds to make it to where every time we need to fix something, we don't have to go to the voters and ask for more money on top of what they're already paying. Arturo? I think the taxpayers of the city have really shown great generosity in, in being willing to, to have the taxes increase in order to have some priorities that you see in the city, but I think, you know, we can, that, that piggy bank has a limit, and I think it's lack of creativity 
and the part of government and the part of the city to simply count on that tax, that property tax. I think we need to find, you know, I think we need to look at the federal level. And, you know, many reasons why we find ourselves here is because a lot of the federal funding has dried up. Uh, so that is no longer coming to our cities and our states. Uh, so we need to be, out there look, be able, willing to look at other alternatives, uh, income tax or, or something. But property tax, I think we need to be more creative on that. That's the easy way out, and I think people have a limit to that. And Chaz is the last one here. And I may be the one with the limit. My mortgage has gone up 33% in 12 years. So the answer to the question is, yes, I would support taxes, but only for social services and only for those transportation projects which actually improved transportation. And I don't believe that MOOC Seattle does in the current status. I think impact fees are a great opportunity. We should be looking at those, linkage fees as well. I also think the head tax and the parking tax need to be returned. Those were great sources of continual low-level income. And, and I also would like to take a look at uh, what we can do with the municipal bank. There are ways that we can fund things. Again, we don't have much information on municipal banking, but that seems to be an opportunity. And for local neighborhood investment, uh, that might provide an opportunity for LIDs for sidewalk repair where you could invest in your own city. Well, that, that is going to conclude the organized part of this uh, forum. I think we should give all of our candidates a big hand for their first <laughs>